All right, this is a presentation by group B25 on Cantor's theorem. We'll also go over a brief overview of sets and cardinality. So let's start on that first topic. What exactly are sets? Well, by textbook definition, a set is an unordered collection of objects. Now, unordered is very important here. And we can say that two sets are equal if and only if they contain the, ex uh, the same elements. So we have three sets here. We have a set PQ7, Q7P, and a set of the duplicates of those, 77, PQQP, so the duplicates. These sets are all equal. It doesn't matter what order they're in or how many duplicates they contain, they contain the same three distinct elements. Now, you can also specify a set by enumeration, such as a set of natural numbers, which goes from zero and all the positive uh, integers. And this is very useful in uh, computer science and computer programming languages. C++ in particular makes handy use of enumeration. But uh, back to sets. A set can be defined as finite or infinite. And a finite set obviously contains a finite set of elements, and an infinite set contains infinitely many distinct elements. Now we can say the cardinality, and the cardinality of a set is denoted by two straight brackets. The cardinality of a finite set is defined as a number of distinct elements in S. You can also define the cardinality of an infinite set, but that's where it gets a little bit interesting because not all infinite uh, sets have the same size, which is a bit counterintuitive. But we'll get to more on that later. So what exactly is the cardinality set? As we said, it's a total number of elements in a set. So for example, let's take a look at this set. As you can see, it has multiple elements, and it's actually a set that contains multiple sets. Now, you might ask yourself, when we're counting the cardinality, do we take into account the cardinality of each of the sets within the set? And the answer to that is no. Uh, we just count, when we're talking about the distinct, uh, the cardinality of S, we count the distinct elements of S. So 1, 2, 3, and 4. This last thing is just one giant set. This one set is an element of S. So there's actually only four distinct elements. So the cardinality is 4. Now, a power set is also important when you're talking about the concept of a set. A power set is just the set of all the subsets of S. So what would the cardinality of that look like? Well, what's a, what's a good example of a power set? Let's say our set S is 0 and 1. Then the power set would be null, or the empty set, 0, 1, and then the set of 0 and 1. So the cardinality of that is 4, and then it can actually be proven that the cardinality of any set is actually 2 to the n, where n is the elements of the original set. So that is a, the cardinality of a power set in a brief definition. Now, some important concepts. Uh, a is a subset of B. Well, this is what that statement says. A is a subset of B, and that means that the elements of A are contained in B, or A is equal to B, which means they share exactly the same elements. You can also say B is a superset of A. Those two statements are equivalent. A is a subset of B, B is a superset of A. They mean this almost the same thing. And A equals B if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Now you can actually say a, uh, a similar thing about cardinality. The cardinality of two sets is equal if and only if the cardinality of B is less than or equal to A, and A is less than or equal to B. That's the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, and it's very useful in uh, proofs dealing with the cardinality of sets. Okay, some more terminology here. Uh, what exactly is a countable set? How, how do you know a set is countable? Because an infinite set can be countable. We mentioned that earlier, not all infinite sets have the same size. Well, a countable set, by definition, is an arbitrary. Uh, well, by definition, an arbitrary set A is said to be countable if there exists an injective or one-to-one -one function f from S to a set of natural numbers n. And we mentioned earlier the natural numbers are just zero, one, two, three, four, all the positive integers, including zero. So there's actually some sets you might be surprised to find countable, such as a set of rational numbers. Um, an uncountable set, however, is a set where you can't draw a one-to-one -one comparison with any countable set. 
Now, what's a good example of this? Well, the real numbers, and we'll get to that later using Cantor's diagonalization argument, uh, how we can prove that the real numbers are not one-to-one. -one. Uh, there's no one-to-one -one function to compare them to a countable set. So Cantor's diagonalization is a mathematical proof that there are infinite sets which cannot be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with the infinite set of natural numbers. So as we mentioned, the infinite set of natural numbers is countable. It actually has a cardinality of aleph null. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that's the, uh, the cardinality of an infinite set which is countable. It's aleph null. Now Cantor's diagonalization exists to show that there's infinite sets which uh, do not have this aleph null cardinality, or they cannot be counted. Our first example is a quick one that discusses how to determine if an infinite set is countable. By definition, we said that the set of positive integers is countable. So, any set with a one-to-one -one correspondence to the set of positive integers is also countable. For example, we take the set of even positive integers. Because each value of a set corresponds with one of the values in the set of positive integers, if by a factor of two, we say it is countable. Our second example is a demonstration of Cantor diagonalization argument to determine if rational numbers are countable. We start by taking all positive integers as the numerator and denominator of a fraction, multiplying them out such that every rational number is accounted for. As you can see, the rows and columns of this table go on forever, and it will be infinitely large. We cannot count the elements of this set in the same way that we can with modifications of the set of positive integers, because for each row, the numerators are the set of positive integers. Instead, we look at the table diagonally and are able to count the rational numbers in that way. We skip over fractions that can be further simplified. Using the Cantor diagonalization argument, we can show that the set of rational numbers is countable, but still infinite. From this, we can make a new sequence, S0, that follows the rule, the nth element of S0 does not equal the nth element of Sn. Using our example, we see that the sequence 0 equals 1, 0, 1, 1. Suppose we have another set T that contains all sequences of zeros and ones. This set must contain S as well as sequence 0. But that means that T does not equal S. Because S is any countable set of sequences of zeros and ones, and T does not equal S, T is uncountable. For the final example, I just wanted to show that the set of positive real numbers is not countable. Though it can be displayed in a way similar to that of the positive rational numbers, the diagonal method does not work because between any two numbers on the list, there is another number, because real numbers are infinite over any interval, thus making positive real numbers uncountable.